for thousands of years would be quote unquote scientists. I mean, can't even call them scientists. They're more like naturalists. They used the Socratic method when it came to studying nature, studying medicine. They would observe, they would try to figure out how it worked, and then they would go and they would argue it with other quote-unquote scientists, naturalists. And if their argument won, well, then everybody just accepted that's how it worked. At no point did they cut something open, did they look at it and examine it up close. Because of this way of doing things that goes back literally to Socrates and ancient Greece and it carried on up until, you know, 14, 1500s easily. We had quite a few wrong ideas on how things worked. Chief amongst those was spontaneous generation. If you left a piece of meat sitting out on a plate, come back in a day or so, poof, maggots would appear. Life came from nothing. And that's how we thought, well, everything else was. Humans, animals, poof, a growing baby suddenly develops inside a woman. And yes, there were other ways they thought of it. You know, the man's ejaculate actually was a miniature person that had to take root in the uterus where it would slowly grow like a plant and develop and all sorts of weird things. <coughs> and that's how we thought of stuff. Diseases. Food spoilage was because of bad air or humors and your body were misaligned. That's where they came up originally with the whole idea of crystals and stuff. Realigning your humors, realigning your energies. That's how they thought for thousands of years what caused diseases, what caused infections. But it wasn't until... 1600s, 1500s, 1600s, that we started to actually develop what we think of and we call the scientific method. That we came out of those dark ages and actually started to develop as true scientists. Instead of just looking at something and trying to figure out how it worked, let's do an experiment. Spontaneous generation, trying to disprove that is a great thing. Many early scientists like Reddy and a few other people that we're not going to worry about in this course tried to show that spontaneous generation was hokum. That the only way life could come about, the only way the maggots could get there, the only way you could get a new human, a new animal, is if you had something living. Maggots came from flies. Flies laid eggs. Eggs hatch, you get larvae. Maggots. Fast forward a couple hundred years, mid-1800s, you get an extremely intelligent, oh my gosh, smart as hell, I wish I could be this smart, researcher by the name of Louis Pasteur. Yeah, Pasteur. Pasteurization. Yeah, this is the guy who came up with the idea of how to pasteurize foods to get rid of microbes. Pasteur originally didn't care about human diseases. He was looking at food spoilage. He was actually hired by quite a few French wineries. They their cask. They'd go, they would squeeze the grapes. They would put the grape juice into the casks and store the casks away. 
come back a few years later and wine. They had no idea how wine came about. We now know that it was amoeba, or sorry, yeast cells, wild yeast growing on the grapes. When it gets mashed, they now go off the grape and into the liquid, the, the grape juice. And then when the grape juice gets put into the casks, there's some yeast there. The yeast eat the sugars, give off ethanol, carbon dioxide, hence wine. But for a couple of years, these wineries, they would come back. They would break open their casks, thinking it's now time to bottle and they would have vinegar, spoiled wine. We now know what happened there is that some bacteria also got in there. Dust, on the dust or something. And these are certain bacteria that like high alcohol concentrations. They break that down and they make acetone, acetic acid, which is vinegar. To study this, Pasteur was looking at what was going on, and he developed an extremely, by modern day standards, an extremely simplistic experiment. Let's boil some broth. Take that broth. I'm going to put it into these flasks. These flasks have these long necks that we're going to bend, that he bent. By bending them, here, down here, dust from the air would collect, and dust-free air could go down into here. Because that was one of the complaints that many people, many quote-unquote scientists at the time had when they were looking at works of Reddy and some of the contemporaries who are studying food spoilage. Well, for have living things, you got to have air. No air, that everything dies, so no wonder you don't see anything. So, Pasteur came up with this. Boiled broth, kill off anything that's there, a tube to allow air in. What he found is the air and all the dust in the air, and there's a lot of dust in the air, would flow up in. The dust would accumulate here, fresh air go down, no spoilage. But when he broke, took off the gooseneck so that air and dust could get directly down in, that broth spoiled within hours. Things started to grow. It became murky. So what did Pasteur prove here? Well, something on the dust is responsible for food spoilage. Microbes on the dust causes food to spoil. You go back a couple hundred years before Pasteur. And you see some of these early scientists, early, you know, late naturalists still, had made some major leaps in the study of microbes. Robert Hooke, back in the 1660s, liked to study plants. But unlike other naturalists at the time, he would actually go and cut a piece off of a plant cut a piece off of a tree and using some ground glass globes to magnify things would look at them and he studied the tissues he studied the cellular arrangements hey look these things that we now call cells have stuff in them they're dynamic heck one of robert hook's longest you know um, gifts to science was coining the term cell. When he was studying the plant tissues, he noticed that they all had this specific arrangement. An arrangement, block, 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 that reminded him of the dormitories in a monastery. 
the monks rooms what we would think of as bedrooms they actually refer to them as their cell and that name stuck 400 years later almost 400 years later we're still using the term cell Antoine van, Leeu van Leeuwenhoek is the man we attribute to the first microscope which you see over here on the left or I'm sorry the right at the end of that needle he would put a drop of something drop of water drop of pond water you know water a drop of water from you know a river a stream a well what you can barely see there is a little circle that has a piece of ground glass in it he would hold this up to a light source to the Sun to a candle and he would look what's in the water now by modern standards this is nothing more than a rudimentary magnifying glass chances are the magnifying glass you had as a kid and you played with is probably more powerful than this but what it allowed him to do was to look at and see for the first time microbes microorganisms swimming and moving around in that drop of water the microbes chances are the magnification this would have chances are what he was looking at were protozoa tetrahymena things like that large single cell eukaryotes this thing's too rudimentary to be able to actually see bacteria but it's the first step on getting there you jump back into the 1800s late 1800s early 1900s you have some spectacular research occurring amazing finds discoveries Ferdinand Cohn was responsible for one of those he was the first to identify and describe bacterial endospores endo means within a spore that's made within the cell of a bacteria <clears throat> he was able to show these things are heat resistant you could boil them and it didn't kill them kills everything else it's like cooking you know a roast you know boiling hot dogs do the same thing these endospores didn't bother them we now know that most endospores are going to be heat resistant chemical resistant radiation resistant ionizing radiation radiation that would make your skin slough off for the most part eh, barely singes these things so nowadays we have levels of cleanliness clean disinfected and sterile when you see anything that's termed sterile that means they have treated whatever it is to the point that all living cells and the endospores have been damaged and killed when you start looking at medical microbiology some of the big giants Oliver Wendell Holmes back in 1843 first to set down and publish a paper showing that the worst thing a new mother could do or a pregnant woman could do was to give birth in a hospital hospitals go to a hospital in during this time period the 17 1800s and you're pretty much guaranteed you're gonna die and you're probably not even gonna die of whatever it is that made you go to the hospital in the first place for some reason Wendell Oliver Wendell Holmes is able to, to figure out that women who gave birth at home fared better greater chance of living think about that for thousands of years women have been giving birth to babies at home in the fields in a barn wherever and they stood a better chance of surviving that messy bloody dirty pr procedure at home in the barn in the field than if they went to a hospital 
contemporary of Mr. Holmes, Ignaz Semmelweis. His work, he was also an MD, worked in a hospital. What he found and what he figured out was he, he was able to publish and show was that for most new mothers, the source of the infection that would ultimately kill them was their very own doctor. Think about that. The doctors would show up in a suit. The suit they just wore in off the street. Most of them would then put on some form of leather apron. And at this time, most patients were in a large room. Their beds lined up to make it easier on the doctor and the medical staff. Privacy was not something you worried about. The doctor would start at patient A, treat, deliver whatever patient A, then immediately go to B. Maybe wipe their hands off on a cloth, maybe not. Definitely wouldn't clean their apron. So whatever patient A got on them, blood, sputum, feces, now going to be exposed to B, to C, to D, to E. Whatever patient B exposed the doctor to is now going to be exposed to C, to D, to E, and so on. And to even make matters worse, since the doctors weren't cleaning in between patients, they weren't wiping themselves off, they weren't, you know, getting rid of the muck. In between patients, doctors would go down and would perform autopsies on cadavers. Two reasons, a couple of reasons. I mean, chief wants to see how they died, why they died, but also to practice their surgical skills. Doctor would get a call. Patient needs to see them. They would wipe off their hands, not wash, wipe off their hands, still wearing the same leather apron, would go see patients with the muck from the cadaver on them. 1860s, Joseph Lister started looking at what's it going to take to keep patients from getting infected. Lister worked in hospital where he noticed the same thing that Wendell Holmes did and that Semblevis did. You know, you look to the picture on the right there, that drawing. All the doctors are in suits. They may have a cloth or a leather apron around them to protect their suit they just wore they wore as they walked in off the street. Lister looked at and developed cleaning techniques. Hand washing before and after surgeries. Hand washing before and after seeing a patient. He developed phenolic solutions, lemons and phenols. We'll talk more about those in a later chapter that would disinfect the hands. Not sterilize, but just at least reduce the number of microbes present. You look at the picture to the right there. This drawing illustrates how they would prep the patient. They would wash their hands in these phenol solutions. And then they would use a sprayer to spray the area to get, you know, to try to quote unquote treat the dust in the air. Not only did Pasteur come up, you know, show with his goose neck bottles, you know, air and dust is what causes spoilage in food. He also examined diseases. TB, uh, rabies, and whatnot, was able to show that many of these diseases we thought just were happenstance were caused by infections. Late 1800s, early 1900s. Medicine, microbiology, infectious diseases specifically, was a wild, wild west show. Somebody 
isolates a bacteria from a patient with pneumonia. Woohoo! I just found a causative agent of pneumonia. Ha ha! Because I isolated it from this patient with pneumonia. And it turns out that no, it's not because somebody else just isolated a different bacteria from a different patient who also has a similar case of pneumonia. Because of that, you know, early on, late 1800s, early 1900s, we had misinformation on what was causing diseases, what did and did not cause diseases. Heck, think about it. Chlamydia pneumoniae, the STD causing bacteria, has absolutely nothing to do with pneumonia, but they isolated it from somebody who had it, and that's how the name got there. It wasn't till a researcher by the name of Robert Koch came along. He also, contemporary of Pasteur, was studying infectious diseases in humans. He also came up with several other, what we now use as modern day microbiological techniques. But his greatest contribution was Koch's postulates. Four postulates, four criteria that have to be met before you can sit there and claim that this microbe causes this disease. First criteria, first postulate, postulate, that the microbe you isolate has to be found in every patient with that disease. Second postulate, once you've isolated, taken out the microbe, you have to be able to culture it in lab. Third criteria, once you've cultured it in lab, you have to be able to give it to a healthy individual, a healthy animal, and it has to cause them to get the same disease. Fourth and final postulate, from that now sick individual, you have to be able to isolate the same exact microbe. If you can meet all four criteria, you now have proven this is what causes this disease.